What's tea, y'all? I know some of you are out there right now having a hard time, having problems in your relationships, having trouble with life. Or maybe you're on social media swiping and swiping, thinking, why can't that be me? Why can't I do that? Why well, I'm here to let you know that you can. This is Create Your Own Story with Terrell Garnett. Will we not only help you create your own story, but we let you tell yours too. Let's get into it, y'all. Like the little intro, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I hate listening to it, though. I hate the sound of my own voice. <laughs> hey, it's all good. I feel you. Um, so, um, everybody, welcome back to Create Your Own Story. I have a special guest. I happen to find him off of Instagram with the ads, and I always tell people, especially that do music, that the ads do work um because there's a lot of artists that i found just from like you know swiping and then i see an ad i said oh wait this actually sounds good um but i'm gonna allow himself to int introduce himself what's good everybody this is princeton michael uh r&b singer songwriter loving to be here blessed to be here appreciate you terrell uh and create your own story happy to be here let's get into it perfect um, so yeah, I just want to get into some dialogue and then ask you a few questions or whatever, just to get to know you and just for the masses to get to know you. Yeah, yeah. Um, so just for the start off, we so you do music and I've seen you've done music for years. How has with the pandemic and everything happened? How has that changed how you done things, if at all? For me, honestly, I was kind of blessed to be in a state of dormancy even before the pandemic happened. Uh, I was kind of in a place of obscurity personally, even mentally speaking, uh, where you might be able to enjoy this portion of your podcast. I was in a rough place mentally. Uh, just life was really hard for me, not necessarily because of music, but honestly, because of my direction with work, my direction with life. Uh, I'm married, so everything was kind of up in the air of what to really do, you know? And so I kind of hit that point of what does this all mean for me moving forward? And so I kind of pulled back from everything and actually took a season of just rest to try and focus on my mental health, believe it or not. So uh, I was actually in obscurity mode and isolation before then. So it kind of prepared me, it wasn't a shocker. Uh, so for me, yeah, I actually took advantage of it because I knew that every single person out there who's doing what I was doing was getting ready to reset to some regard, you know, so I knew that if I was going to take the time to rest for a second, now is the time just for that simple fact of nobody else is doing this either. You know, you listen to all of these influences like Corday, he was saying it too. I mean, he traveled all over the world. He, he reflected on himself, did a lot of reflection in terms of his mental state, what the direction he wanted to go in, and then he came out stronger. I'm sure countless artists did that. So for me, I kind of saw it as a sweet spot uh, to where I just sat back and relaxed. And then towards the end of it, that's actually where my biggest breakthrough came from in terms of potentially the biggest record I ever wrote thus far with no better time. So there was no, and no pun intended on that whatsoever, <laughs> but it's like, it literally came out of nowhere. And I was kind of just stagnant. I really was not focused on music, to be honest. I wasn't even recording. Um, there was so much going on in the world, obviously, with the race relations, everything. It stirred me actually to go back to school. So I actually was focused heavily on school. Um, so, but I really just, it kind of hit me deep in my soul. And I was like, you know what? Now might be the time, probably nine, 10 months in, I hadn't done anything. And I literally got on my computer in 20 seconds, found a beat. I don't know how I did that. You know, normally it takes me an hour and a half to find something that I'm digging and I just flowed and believe it or not, it's actually the song that took me to the point of where I'm at now. I mean, that's, that's why we're here today because you saw that. So uh, 
I think there was an opportunity there in the midst of the pandemic. So I think a lot of artists capitalized and then a lot of artists retracted depending on where they were at mentally. Uh, but yeah. I think it was a rude awakening if you weren't prepared for what it would do to yourself from a cognitive standpoint. So I'm blessed to have come out on top and truthfully that season propelled me forward into this one without me even knowing that that's what it was going to do. That's amazing. That's amazing. Um, so going back, I know you said that you were going through a lot. How do you naturally handle um, emotional pain? Man, so for me, to be honest, because I was actually, I actually in took my, put myself in therapy for it because I come from a pastor's home to where everything is about God, literally. Um, if you feel anything that is not of God, we're going to the altar. You feel this, we're going to the altar. You feel that, we're going to the altar. You feel that again, we're going under the altar. So it's yeah. like, it's, it's really hard to understand the direction you're supposed to go when all you know is spiritual and biblical principles. And I kind of had to step back and say, what does this mean for me not being in my parents' home anymore and under their authority? Uh, what does this look like moving forward? So for me, I actually had to utilize that therapy to teach me because one of the biggest things they realize is you don't know how to process your emotions. And it was kind of weird. They're like, that's actually probably why you're depressed is because in your case scenario, from everything you're telling me, your parents did not prepare you to receive frustration, receive confusion, receive sadness. They would have basically put it on you to say, pray it away, instead of understanding what that means from a humanistic standpoint. So for me, I got hit hard with that and had to really learn, and I'm still learning to this day uh, that these are feelings that are normal. It's part of our body, for, even from a scientific standpoint, this is what is supposed to happen. It's a language to a certain extent, and to ignore it actually fuels those feelings more. So I'm learning how to understand what those feelings are, what exactly they're saying, and then how to mitigate that situation once I understand. But it's definitely been a learning experience because I was not given that. I had to have someone from therapy tell me this is what it is and here's what I recommend you do. Well, that's amazing though. I mean, you weren't um, scared. I know a lot of uh, the black community, we are, it's like taboo, especially for the men to go to therapy. Um, so I commend you on actually getting out and, and seeking the help that you need. And I feel like a lot of people need to, I have, um, I don't think they're going to listen to this podcast, but they don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but I have, um, I don't even want to, like, they're going to know not to put them on front street. Um, but my cousin's, uh, boyfriend, I know he stated that he doesn't believe in therapy, that it is a reason for, um, you know, the white man to, to another reason for the white man to put down the black people or stuff. And I'm just like, I don't like, I get what he was saying and what he was coming from, but at the same time, like it's scientifically proven, like these are facts that, you know, yeah. you get depressed yeah. and I mean, people just don't know how to work through it, you know? Yeah. Um, and some people may need to go on medication. Some people may not. Um, for sure. And it, and it's funny though, because like, I'm like at, everything that you're saying and how you act and react to certain things shows that you actually need therapy and he has been through a lot in his life and granted he's holding up pretty well but like if you don't have anybody to go to which you know the person doesn't then how, how are you coping like at, at some point you're yeah. going to have some type of burnout absolutely so, absolutely um so just to get into some more dialogue and some ask you some more questions um what what is the biggest hope for the future for you whether it be your yeah I mean the biggest hope for me even though it's a broad general question I have a very simplistic answer for that that I hope people can resonate with the biggest hope for me is to live a life of peace uh why because I know what it's like to not be in peace and I know what it's like to not be in a place of peace for almost a decade and it is a rough spot to be, a rough spot to be. And I think one of the greatest ways that for me as an individual, I can get to that state of peace is 
to actually count on using the things that I feel God has given me to be able to find that piece. So for me, it is music. Um, I'm an avid hockey player. Uh, I've been playing for almost 20 years. So I think people have to figure out what it is that makes you tick and understand that those are the pinpoints and connecting points of reference that are supposed to create the peace around you. And when you don't have those things flowing, it becomes very difficult for you to find that peace. So I can't solely say, I just want music to work out. Why? Because that doesn't necessarily result in long-term peace. For me, it's what does everything look like to generate long-term peace? So for me, that is constantly doing all of those things. Uh, and for me, that's where I feel as though my greatest hope in life is. And then for that to radiate off and for people to also feel that peace that I have. Because again, I don't care if you have $20 million, $200 million uh, in the world, if you don't have peace, you're lost. And I think anyone is gonna say that because money cannot give you peace. Uh, people cannot give you peace. You have to find that from within and find a way to stay in that presence of peace so you can conduct everything that you need to do. I think that's what makes us the best versions of ourselves is knowing that instead of taking this route of emotion, let my peace override it and understand these are the facts of life. It's gonna happen. Even if I knock this situation out again, I already have to know that it'll happen again. And again, after that, I think we have to be aware as human beings that life is cycles in seasons, just like the seasons, there will be things that continuously keep happening. And so to mitigate that, if that causes you anxiety or frustration or fear, it's essentially, I have to find a way to be in the best mental presence to continue to go through those seasons. Yeah, no, I 100% agree. I was talking to somebody um, a couple of weeks ago, they were like going through something and I was asking them, I was like, well, what makes you happy? And they're like money. And I'm like, no, money doesn't make you happy. <laughs> the things that you, you're you able to get are, you know, yeah. money. I do things that may make you happy, but money doesn't make you happy. And like, they have like a, right. now like they, they really didn't know what made them happy. Um, and sometimes yeah. go, we just go through with the motions and we look at society or even social media. And if you don't have these things or this, that, and the third, then, you know, you're not a success or you're not, at, at peace or you're not something you know um so with that being said what what does success look like for you what does it mean to you uh, I guess I could piggyback off of that you know for me I was I was actually just talking to uh my team about this in, in regards to the, the daily conversations we have about things going on and I said success is an individual perception you know, there's no finite detail to it. Just like if you ask 20 people, and this is literally what I told him, what I'm telling you, if you ask 20 people what love is, you're going to get 20 different answers. You're going to get 20 different answers what success is because it's all based off of their interpretation of what they feel will make them successful. And I told him, I said, if you feel like having a family, a uh, successful marriage, a decent job, then that's success to you. And no one can fault you for that. You yeah. know, uh, if you feel like success to you is uh, a 5,000 square foot home, $250,000 salary per year, and an AMG, that's success to you, then I can't fault you for that either. You know, that's why, again, I reiterate, it's an individual perception. So for me, success is being the best version of yourself in order to inherit most of those things because they'll come period we yeah. believe it's i mean when we look at it in the natural you're gonna get a job it doesn't matter if you're doing what you love or doing something that you hate mm -hmm. you're gonna get a job because we're conditioned to say we have to figure out a way to make money come to us i don't care if you're an investor I don't care if you're a, a businessman who's starting a, a Fortune 500 company, it's a startup, you're still working. So our mentality as human beings is to work. We can't just sit. So work is going to come. Chances are we're going to find a significant other. We're better with other people. It doesn't matter. 
So all of those things, technically speaking, are the basis and the foundation of what unites us all. That's why we see most people are married. Most people have kids. Most people have a job. Maybe that's the line where we start from. And then after that, you determine what it is that you want to achieve. So for me, I already have that baseline. For me, it's about what does the future look like in regards to what I already have, amplifying that and moving forward. So for me, success is being the best person, the best version of myself with that baseline that I already have. And since it's an individual perception, for me, success is also using my skill set to benefit others' lives. I'm the kind of person to where I look for people to bless. And when I see that opportunity, it's nothing for me to cash app someone, random, stranger, or not. That's the kind of person I am. So I always say, this is why you have to keep moving forward with music and all these other endeavors you're doing, because you're realizing money is essentially a tool. And with that tool, this is what you're choosing to do. So you're choosing to try and find other people to bless and change their negative narrative. So if that's the case, then that should be added into your vision of success. I'd love to be able to be in a financial position to where any person I have a five to 10 minute conversation with, if I sense there's a need, I want to be able to move on it. And by the time we get off that phone, I've alleviated some element of stress in their lives. That's amazing. That's totally amazing. Well, I do want to leeway into one of your songs. Um, yeah, yeah, let's get into it. Um, so I listened to your music and this one stood out to me. This one is called Don't You Know. You want to tell us a little bit about it before I play it? Oh, man. Don't you? That was made pre-pandemic as part of my efforts to say I actually did everything on that song myself. Um mm-hmm. And I don't consider myself a producer, uh, but I play piano. So I naturally write almost 60, 70% of my music from the piano. That was no different. Uh, But I was in a phase of my life where I was just like, I don't have any money. I don't have any way of getting this sound out. Here's what I do have. If I kill, I'm going to tell you the kicker here, because this is all part of why I love doing what I'm doing right now with you. The best thing I can say about this song is it was made here and you froze. Crazy part is I used my own resources to develop that song, an iPad and this microphone. And I that's made that. You know. That's amazing. Well, that's- <laughs> Get into it. This is dope. Yeah. I want to be the rain that falls on the clouds and scratches your skin. Let's begin. Hey. And I want to be I just want to take you up and never come down. Listen to some love and get this for the motel. Be alone with you. It's where I want to be. Just to feel my hands on your waist. Part in the most and nothing else is supposed to be.
Again, that was a don't you know. So just to get back into some more dialogue, um, what do you, this is, might be an or, unorthodox question, but. Yeah, go ahead. What mistake you, that you've made that has changed your life for the better? Oh, man. I'm prepared to talk about this. This is the first time I'm gonna say this publicly. So I've been married for five years. I'm the kind of person who takes 30 minutes, sometimes an hour to review a phone case before I buy it. I don't care <laughs> if it's $5. Yet when I met my wife, I chose to uproot my life. I was working for Apple at the time. I chose to uproot my life from Michigan to Florida in five seconds. Mm. No review, no interpret, no analysis, no critical thinking, just I hit my six months with Apple and transferred like that. And I can tell you no lie. My life went like that. Mm. Marriage falling apart, no friends, life in utter disarray, and just thinking to myself, what have I done? Because this is all a result of you doing something too fast that was too life altering. Mm -hmm. And so it put me in such a bind where for the first time in my life, I felt depression didn't even know what it felt like, um, but totally racked me. And so I spent, this was even before the emotional conversation, like I was telling you, I spent about a year and a half in therapy to help me deal with the fact that he basically had stated you overwhelmed your life with too much change. And because the change is not resulting in any positive narrative, it's going to present the signs of depression, uh, sadness, loneliness, all of those things. And so when I did that to myself, I didn't realize the detrimental consequences that would, would come from that. And so, again, I'm the guy who takes all of that time to buy something so small because I care about the case. I care about the product. I want it to work. Yet in that particular situation, I just pulled the trigger and everyone around me, not even having anything to do with my wife, everyone around me was basically saying, are you sure? Because I'm concerned. And that concern was essentially, they knew that I was probably jumping the gun too much, not even in regard to my wife, but just such a major shift, 940, 50 some miles away. So in my time in Florida, I met no friends. I met, I mean, it was so difficult for me to get myself grounded, but to slide back into the purpose of setting that foundation is, I used to play hockey for you know, travel teams and all of that well prior to that. I had to stop earlier than expected about 17, 18 years old from back issues and whatnot, uh, weren't even related to hockey. But I say that to say once I kind of had enough with how many jobs I was losing while I was there, I put myself in position to say, you know what, let's just stop. Stop, reset, put yourself in a position where you can heal mentally. And I went back to hockey and I started skating three times a week at our rink where I, I used to live. And within about three years, two to three years, I met a group of kids that kind of welcomed me in a way where it was just like, keep in mind, these are younger kids, like mentee kids. Mm -hmm. I met these kids and saw a place for me to have a need of saying, there's a need here. These kids look at me, they respect my wisdom, they respect my knowledge. And in turn, they made me a beast at hockey to the point to where 
to this day, people still ask me to consider playing pro. And I don't even, I don't even have the traditional story of most of my friends. I have a few guys who are NHL draft picks coming up next month. Um, several of them are division one commits and, you know, keep in mind, I met them when they're like 15, 16 years old, and this is their future now. But the point of that is they welcomed me into their circle from seeing a need like this kid's always here. And they slowly started to see how good I was getting. And before you know it, it opened up this door of where I have this dynamic passion for the game that I never thought. And essentially, I want to use that moving forward. Uh, I don't know if you know how Justin Bieber is heavily obsessed with hockey from being from Canada and whatnot. And so I tell my team, because there's some very major things going on right now, that if I ever get the opportunity to have conversation with him, that I would love to present the idea of starting a nonprofit through hockey and having that idea be thrown out on the table to see what he thinks. Uh, and so it ignited something in me to where I saw a need that I wanted to fill. And to this day, these kids look at me as a mentor. And so seeing their growth, I, they went from training me to me training them on and off the ice, which is crazy because they cannot believe that I got that skilled and no one really understands except a few people that that was my outlet from how much pain I was dealing with because it was the safest place for me to be from all the jobs failing, no friends, you know, marriage having so many, it was the safest place for me to be. And so I put all my eggs into one basket and just went all out. And to the point to where if I really wanted to pursue it, that they even all believe you could pursue a minor professional career, even if it was for a year or two, but that, that came from that. And so those relationships, I believe are lifelong and it's opened up a pathway for me to see, not only is it about the mistake, the lesson, but it's also about the potential growth that can come from that. Uh, it didn't really shape me musically speaking, because I've always been in that lane. But that season of obscurity, like I said, when we first started, gave me no better time. So I do look at it and say, had I not gone, would I be here? And to be honest, I don't believe I would. I don't think I'd be playing hockey. I don't think I have any of those relationships. How? Because I met those kids literally skating. So unless it was through some other miracle, how would I have made those relationships literal? So to me, I've turned it around to a blessing to where I don't look at that time in my life because it's already over. As, as long as it was, as quick, it, it's already over. So I've already changed my mentality to say, look at what came from that. Mm -hmm. And here we are today. That's amazing. That's an, uh, that's an amazing testimony. Yeah. Uh, what, what made you, do you still live in Florida? I don't. So I live in Michigan now. I moved back because I had to make the decision of if this was a mistake, how do you rectify the situation? Mm -hmm. If you know that you had no growth there, outside of the hockey and you don't want to pursue that route, then what does that mean for you? So for me, that meant relocation to start back, go back to square one from where you left. I left from Michigan, go back to Michigan. So about four months ago, I moved back to get myself back on track from where I prematurely left. And the ironic part is several of those kids are here because up north this is hockey country yeah like this is where the craziest of skill comes from and so i didn't even lose them they're here yeah that that's was awesome. the hard that was the hard part because in their off season was the only time i saw them that's when they flew back to florida but in their once the regular season started 
I lost them and then they'd be gone for five, six, seven months. So it's like, dang, that sucks. But back home, they're going to be right there. And so even from being back home, I've already seen three of them, you know, just from being here, going to their games and supporting them and whatnot. Uh, one of them sl uh, slated to potentially go in top 20 overall um, next month in the NHL draft. So it's like, it came full circle as crazy as it is. He'll be playing at the university of Michigan next year. So it's like this whole catastrophe literally came full circle to where I literally brought myself back to a place of peace, but stronger and more aware and with a clearer path of how I can be more successful and learn from the decision that I made. Cause ironically, that was my first big decision being a pastor's kid. And it mm. ended up being my most difficult and worst decision I made. Yeah. Well, hindsight's yeah. funny. Um, but yeah. I mean, there, maybe you were meant to be there for that period of time. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, well, I'm going to play another one of your songs before we get into some more. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, this one is, is your newest single, Everything. Yeah. Uh, so you want to tell us a little bit about that? Man, everything, that was a dope video to shoot. I mean, I'm a classic R&B lover. I, I love Avant, Tyrese, Tank, Genuine, Usher. I mean, I, I love all the greats. And when I heard that instrumentation, I was just like, oh, snap. I got something for this already. And before you know it, everything was created. And I'm like, this is my tribute to the greats right here. Everything. Okay, well, let's get into it. Yes. Yeah, it would help if I was playing it from the right phone now, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> general consensus that's why i did it i'm like hey this is my tribute to y'all right here yeah i read something on 
think it was Instagram or Twitter that they're like music and TV shows haven't been the same since the 90s. Like that was the greatest time for those things. And I'm like, dang, they actually are right. Like we had like say say by the bell, fresh friends, family matters, like we had classic. You already know. Yeah. You already know. I, I'm happy that I was born in the time to experience all that stuff. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's a beautiful thing. So what would you say your greatest strength is? My greatest strength is communication. Um, why? Because of my parents, seeing my parents, my dad being a pastor. Um, my mom also did it a lot of it. It's a lot of it as well. Uh, but they really taught me how to express myself uh, very early on, whether I liked it or not. There'd be days where I I recall me getting up in front of our congregation and I'm 10 years old and they gave me the mic and Lord knows I wanted to run so bad, but I knew that that would have been embarrassing because I was old enough to understand that. So they put me out there and they put me in rooms with people where they purposely set me up to speak. And back then it sucked. Now it's gravy because interviews don't phase me at all i'm talking about like jobs i don't care who you are you could be the ceo you could be jeff bezos i will talk to him the same way i'm talking to you like i'm not phased at all in terms of how some people can get shy and timid depending on who the person is i yeah it's it's literally my greatest skill set is to just always effectively communicate and um just really make my presence known in a room when I'm asked to speak. And so it's, it's needed in what I do, but I find greater purpose in moments like this, because this is when I really want to let that stuff shine because the bigger that these opportunities get, it's, you really want to have a firm grasp on what it is that you're trying to convey to your audience instead of having all these long pauses and not really knowing what to say and you're having this platform to speak, that's when that becomes very beneficial. That's why some artists don't like interviewing because they only feel comfortable making music straight up and you can't fault them for that, but you lose that level of influence when you can't speak like that. And so I think the most dynamic of entertainers, actors, you name it, painters, anyone are the people who can convey how how they feel and strengthen other people's lives through their wisdom as well. So communication without a doubt, but I cannot take any credit for that because it was nothing but my parents forcing me to learn how to speak at a very early age when most people, most kids would have literally been playing outside. Instead, they had me talking to the guest pastor, like I said, in front of our congregation my dad would have me sitting in on his rotary meetings in Wisconsin when we lived. So it's just like, dang, Pops, like, is this really necessary? But I'm indebted to him for that because here I am now. No, I like that. I, I think that um, I can tell that you're a really good communicator. I can tell you you're very well. Um, and you give long answers, which I love because on this podcast, I have some people on here and they give like the <laughs> sh- answers So then I'm like, OK, I got to, you know. <laughs> pull like I gotta pull I gotta me. carry this right now and sometimes it's just like I can tell like oh you really just don't like either you don't want to talk about this or you don't want to yeah. talk yeah, you that. yeah. <laughs> you don't talk about anything and so when I bring up something then you you know yeah. like um so it it sometimes it's hard and then and I uh I don't really like those interviews <laughs> or, I mean, I'm sure it's a challenge I don't want it to seem like an interview either. I want it to seem more of like a conversation, a dialogue. Yeah, it's a conversation. Absolutely. Exactly. Some people, you just can't, you can't have that. So I, uh-huh. I definitely appreciate you. Um, sure. Or I appreciate your parents for being yeah. for so well-spoken and, and, and engaging. Yeah, um, for sure. I had a question too. I went on a rant right now and I forgot about it. Um, You're all good. I don't know. Um, but um, dang, what was I going to ask you? It wasn't even on here. Um, but what would you say your your favorite imperfection about yourself is? 
That's a tough question. I don't think I've ever been given that answer um, or given that question, but I, I feel like I know the answer. I just have to figure out how to actually convey it. Um, my favorite imperfection. Gosh. So for me, this, this like to be honest, this, because sometimes my communication not everyone is able when you communicate a certain way it's very difficult certain when like you just said with certain individuals if you can't match that energy uh you almost have to be skillful enough to either come down and pull them up with you or you have to come down and stay there yeah and so sometimes i've run into issues to where especially with having the education that i have as well to where it almost sounds intimidating to people. But the crazy part about it is people have said the same thing about my father and he's a McDonald's, he's an executive for McDonald's, but he, so he speaks a lot for his work. Mm -hmm. um, so in a sense, it is an imperfection because I do tend to overanalyze stuff because I'm so critical. I'm especially with like, I'm an Africana studies major. So most of everything I'm doing right now is critical thinking. You know, it's theory. It's based off of your own interpretation, based off of the particular subject matter. So yeah. it's really hard for me to get away from that in the real world. Sometimes I will have those moments where I'll go, I did it this morning with my brother at breakfast, where I will just go collegiate on 10. Mm -hmm. And then you you leave the natural realm of conversation yeah. and sometimes sometimes people don't always they, they just want a really a little bit more of a lax conversation and sometimes that's very hard for me to do because I feel like I shine best this way but I also know that not everyone is going to agree with that especially depending on the relationship so for me I have to understand how to balance those two because there's a time and place for all of it you know, because uh, the downside of that is for the other person, if they struggle to come up to that new level in a place of professionalism, then they're going to wish that they actually had that. So it's a catch 22. Uh, but that's from my father, that 100% from my father is his DNA is flowing through me in that way, because I cannot help but to be critical when I think and to be critical when I speak. And so I've been called out on that before as you're going too deep, you're doing that you're, so I get it. Sometimes less is more, but I'll always argue that by saying, but if this is a critical analysis and we're thinking deep, Princeton, no, it's not that deep. I look at it as, uh, it could be like, just let me flow here for a second. But again, that's where you have to read the room and understand if someone is really asking it to be a little bit less. It's even happened in college before. So I know that that's an imperfection because sometimes I like to go hard to make sure everything that's in there gets out. And sometimes even from a collegiate level, like I just said, it's not always necessary. No, I totally I, I yeah. agree with so like for me, it would have to be, um, I, I can be very straightforward sometimes. Um, yeah. And I think that comes with me not be, being impatient with things. Mm -hmm. So because I'm impatient with certain things, my, my delivery is very short and quick and to the point. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it can come off being harsh. Yeah. But not my intention, but that's just, you know, so I have yeah. to on, on that. Um, so sometimes I just don't speak in certain occasions because I'm just like, I, I don't know a nice way of putting it. <laughs> yeah, I feel you. I feel thing. you. I know people like that. And then I also feel that like, even with relationships that I have, like um, I'm realizing, or I have realized that like not all relationships need to be, you know, like not this friend is not going to be the friend that I go to about things that Correct. doesn't doesn't mean that that person's not necessarily a good friend they're just not that type of friend compartmentalized and I've had to um go through that because I'm like I've had one friend where 
I was really close with, or I've had two friends that I was really close with and one, like I'm able to tell them certain things or whatever. Um, and then the other one, um, I just don't, I can't express myself at all. Like, you know, in that type of way. If I'm, um, and I actually cherish that friendship more. Granted, I'm not friends with any of them anymore, but I actually preferred that friendship more because it was, it was just easy to be that person's friend. Yeah, yeah. Um, like I didn't have to work, I didn't have to do anything. We just had fun. It was just easy. So I'm just like, oh, I wish I would have um, realized that then. Granted, they weren't they weren't a good friend <laughs> besides the point. Yeah. Besides the point. But I I I wish I would have realized that then because sometimes we put expectation and pressure on certain things or people um, yeah. that there. Yeah. Yep. I feel you. You're absolutely right. Um. So what um what have you learned about yourself that had within the last year or so that has surprised you? Mm. Wow. I know the answer to that, but again, this will be the first time that I publicly say it from a spiritual standpoint. There are things that I'm critically thinking about and having deeper analysis on which it's needed in this area in my, it's needed. But only knowing the Bible, I think at my age, I've been able to understand that it's bigger than that. And when I say, I'm trying to say this in a certain way, and when I say it's bigger than that, I believe that there are elements that are being missed in everyone's spiritual walk uh, to where, it's starting to get too compartmentalized where you're judging everyone based off of if it doesn't look like the Bible. Yeah. And part of my studies as well from Africana studies, I've studied a lot of indigenous culture as well. And so I say that to set the stage to say, when you have that knowledge, and this is why I'm literally taking this field of study because I feel like we would be a better people if we understood how other cultures thought uh, from a historic standpoint. I'm not talking about presently. I'm talking about from a historical context to go back thousands of years to understand why things are the way they are today. I believe a lot of answers are locked up in that. And so for me, I literally saw a trend in my studies to where I'm saying, but they're not wrong. Yeah. But they're not wrong but they're not wrong either. Like, like what is going on here? And so I say that to say, I'm discovering that there's more to it than how we have conditioned religion. Obviously that's a very frowned upon term, but there's a whole lot more to it with how we have conditioned the Bible that we're missing huge elements of our own spirituality here and here that are connecting us where people if they if we actually studied we can see connecting points from all of these cultures even from an indigenous standpoint african culture the earliest of european cultures we can see these connections of all of these subgroups of people on the face of this earth where we're missing that our society has literally tailored religion to the bible but the crazy part about it is the bible was actually not, not created in that time of the indigenous culture uh that, th there was nothing there in that mind in, in that mentality so when you're missing elements you fill it in man fills it in instead mm -hmm. of actually critically thinking it's an opportunity for man to write his own story yeah and so those gaps nine times out of 10 are wrong. And that's what I'm learning. And it's, it's heartbreaking, but it's also a, a freedom that comes with it to understand there's something going on here that we're missing because we've conditioned ourselves to see religion this way. That totally so it's, it's, it's dividing us. And we're saying everyone is wrong when 
there's historical evidence that supports otherwise, where if we actually broke down all of these other groups of people, we see a common ground that makes no sense other than, no, we're actually all united in a way that the Bible doesn't actually present. And so I can't abandon my faith, no. It's what I know, but I also know that this is the moment in time where I feel like I'm having an awakening and all throughout history, there have been moments like that where there has been a great awakening, literally the name of men and women having this rude awakening from a mental standpoint of this is what we thought, however, it's wrong. How do we move forward with a different mentality? And I kind of feel like that's exactly what's happening to me because my entire life has been based off of scripture. Yeah. I'm also choosing to go deeper and understand how other groups of peoplehood think Mm -hmm. from a very deeply rooted historical context that has nothing to do with what we see today. And it's very beautiful when you see that when people give the cliche statement, we're more alike than we are different. It's too cliche, but when you attach it to history, we literally are more alike than we think. And most of it is from something that most people felt within their hearts and in their minds and they transformed it into a culture. So to say that all of these individuals are wrong is not the way to go about it. You have to actually understand anthropology to be able to see that people are the way they are because of how they interpreted what you know today as well. Yeah. So that's the connecting point is you were tradi- you uh, were compartmentalized the same way that this religion was, that this religion was, that this religion was. It doesn't make us wrong. It makes us, we chose to be separated from how we think to other groups based off of how we eat, uh, what we do in our leisure, the music we listen to, the homes we live in. All of this has to be analyzed when you look at how people think. So to sum it up, I'm having a spiritual awakening where I'm understanding that there's a bigger picture that needs to be interpreted here that would actually potentially give us the resources to bring us back together instead of all of this division that we have today. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. And I've had like similar, not so in-depth conversations with people um, because I'm with religion. I know it's a sticky thing. You don't want to yeah, offend anyone. Absolutely. Um, but I was telling even workers, we were having this conversation and I was saying, I was stating that how the story of Jesus Christ, which I do believe, um, but like he wasn't the first, like this, the, there's a similar story like that, that happened before Jesus Christ. And there's so much more knowledge, you know, that, that goes on, but we don't really go in and look for it or we, we're okay with how things are or we're okay not getting getting much substance out of things Mm -hmm. um and and at at some point we can't we can't live like that like i feel like so many people live for for themselves and selfishly um instead of living for you know the world and 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 everybody else in it Um, yeah and once i think we start to change that narrative then things can start going in the right direction but um, how things are right now, I, I don't see that happening. I know. That's why I'm like, man, you guys can stay over here because everyone is looking for a way to continue to compartmentalize everyone. And it's like, you guys are missing the potential beauty in trying to dissect every single person here. Or not, not necessarily every single person, but every single culture. This is why I think this pivotal in education to better establish a mentality of what culture really means, even from a continental standpoint, you got to be able to understand people. Yeah. 
and understand where those thoughts came from, even racism for that matter. That has nothing to do, you can call it culture, but I'm not talking about race. Racism isn't a culture in regards to what food you eat, the music you listen to, the land that you lived on. It, racism has, it's an idea. It's an idea. So food is not an idea. Where you live geographically is not an idea. The, the land that you cultivated, the language that you speak, those aren't ideas. That's literally a part of a peoplehood. So when you break those things down, that's where I feel like we'd be able to better understand our fellow brothers and sisters to understand if you really knew their story, you wouldn't feel like they were wrong. You would say, this is what makes us different, yet this is what also makes us the same. No, I totally, I totally agree with that. I know I was having this conversation with one of my cousins um, and well, to go back a little bit. So my cousins are mixed. They're half black and then half like Hawaiian and, and, yeah. uh, but they're basically, even though their father didn't really know his lineage, which he's uh, like Hawaiian and some other stuff. Um, my aunt's black. Um, they were kind of raised white. Like they lived like in the upper class, middle class. Um, so like, I remember asking them, like, um, I say brothers and my cousins, um, but I was asking them, um, what what do you identify as? Like, I just was just curious question, like, what, what do you identify as? And one of them said, um, American. And I said, well, what does that mean? Like, what does that look like? What does that mean? Um, and they couldn't give an answer. And they end up getting really, really upset with me. Yeah. I'm just like, and they look different. They don't look black, but they look, they, they don't look white either. So they look like there's something, you know, who knows? Yeah. Um, but I'm like, well, you know, I, the reason I asked this question, because like with, and I asked this question during the time of like the whole racial injustice, yeah. that was the George Floyd thing. And I'm like, cause I can understand you guys feeling like you guys can't, you don't fit in. I get that. Cause I can, relate to that in some some shape or forms and then on the other side I was like but you don't really understand how I feel where I'm coming from with certain things that happen to me because you guys don't look like me so you guys are not gonna get judged the same way that I am judged and I'm trying to like kind of explain it in, in a certain thing and I'm like granted I've never necessarily been profiled by the police but I've had jobs where I were well not jobs but I've it, I've applied at places where I've been called the n-word and they didn't want to give me an application or certain things and and I'm just trying to understand like how how do you how are you guys you know navigating your lives like with yeah. your experience because I do want to understand every everybody yeah. and um was it, I thought it was so crazy, but it made me think like, oh, wow, like, even though they were basically grew up around all of their family, which is primarily black, they, one of them said that they were uncomfortable around black people. Yeah. Um, makes you like, think like, oh, like, even though you think that in some ways we are a, a lot alike, but some, our perception on things are, are so skewed and so, so different. Um, yeah. I don't know where I was going with this. <laughs> Somewhere <laughs> with this. But um, the other, okay, I remember the other day I was talking to one of them and I was saying that, like, so I live in California and I, and as you, you know, everybody knows California is uh, predominantly um, Hispanic. Yeah. Um, like 60% of the population out here is Hispanic. And where yeah. I, it's like 60%. Um, and then 1.8% is african-american and then there's like in like 30 percent white and there's asian whatever the case is um so i i was telling them i was like yeah now, i've gotten rid of a lot of different friends or whatever but i was like now i want to meet friends where i connect culturally on certain things like we share the same likeness of things like i need to make more black friends and yeah. they're like I and I was like just because like a lot of my friends like certain things that we do or they don't, like I don't want to have to explain myself on why this is happening or if I see something yeah. funny I send it to them because they're not going to get it yeah. like, um and I was like and I feel like that's what I want 
now. Um, but at the same time, it's a catch-22 because I feel like a lot of African-Americans, and don't shoot me for saying this, but I feel that like they, they, or I should say we, we, um, we're trying to be something that maybe we're not in a sense, uh, whether it be like having these cars because we think that again, like back to success, this is what makes us look yeah. successful. So we're spending all of our money and we're not saving it. And then that comes down to, we don't know how like generational wealth is not something that we've learned. We don't know how to save. And yeah. I've even had a conversation with mom, my mom before. I'm like, why haven't you told me? She's still like, well, I didn't. So how could I teach you something? I don't know. Yeah. And I'm like it's not your fault but we're we're all you know in the same page on the same book but we're not really reading the pages I guess you could say um but I I do want to be able to you know learn more about like just even the stuff that you're saying like it's so insightful and it's so much knowledge because I love all people I may say some stuff that may people may think that I don't yeah. Here and there, but I just make jokes. Um, but I love all people, and I just want us to all be able to get along. And I've even had this thing more so recently at my job within the last um within the last like six months or so, where I've like I'm a very expressive person, and I think that that um just like you are, I like to communicate. I if I'm feeling a certain type of way, like you're gonna know about it. Um, and I've done this at work where everybody knows that I'm the outspoken person. I'm like literally in the role that I have, I'm the, like the only black person out of the 300 people that they have there. There's probably like five black people. Um, so I say that to say when I, when I'm, I'm speaking up on something and my direct manager at the time, she like was giving me pushback in a sense, but I'm, I'm not backing down. So like I'm saying stuff and now I'm getting upset because like, I feel like you're making me look like the angry black person. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I'm not yeah. trying that. Like, you're just not understanding what I'm saying to you. Yeah. And, and now I'm getting frustrated. And like, this is in front of everybody. And I'm just like, you know, like, what, what do I do here? Like, you know, like, because yeah. nobody else is speaking up and they all agree with me, but no one else has, you know, a backbone or whatnot. So I'm the one that's going to speak up. But now I look like the angry black person and now I'm perceived a certain way. And even if you don't think that, my perception is that I look like that. I don't want to look like how they show us on TV with the, you know, love and hip hop and housewives. Granted, I do like some ratchet TV, but we're not all like that. And I remember watching a show where um, this lady was saying, I don't know what I was like, but she was saying she was a white, white lady and she was saying that the she's never been around black people and in certain cities like there isn't any other people uh, so yeah. all they know is what they see on tv correct um uh, in that ad that you know like that's the perception that you know we're giving out and you know yeah and but i mean granted if they were acting like normal who would watch it <laughs> yeah yeah so yep. i went on a rant there oh, um, I, I agree i um, agree 100 but I, you want to get into the one the last song i'm going to play and it's actually you already know what it is because we've been talking about it no better time um and i it's very um a lot it's very it's easy to listen to and i mean that in the best possible way um it's one of those songs that you can like you want to hear it again after you hear it no it's a simplistic record and it's what's changing my life as we speak uh it's what made me get discovered um, it's what made me, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'd have to ask him how much I could say, but it's, it's literally the record that has changed the narrative of, of this isn't Princeton. This is Princeton. Like, okay, let's, let's start talking business. So for me, it literally is the song that I, like I said, that came from being in the pandemic, not purposely. It was the first song that I wrote since being on a break uh, for almost a year. So I didn't even, I knew it was special, but I didn't realize what I may have potentially done until I got the feedback that I got. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, without further ado, man, it's no better time than now to play No Better Time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
a day since i've heard it like it's just so hey you know, man that's what's up yeah that's so up. i have this playlist and i've been saying this every podcast and i'm pretty sure my faithful listeners probably saying yeah. ain't worth nothing but so i have this playlist that i made um it's called um terrell garnett presents um a vibe sold separately and provide some separate and um, it's on apple music and spotify well, currently it's not on apple music and spotify because i've been saying this for so long and i've been working on this playlist for since june of last year i got and, you and uh, i just wanted to be perfect like so when i make playlists like i have a few playlists out there but i like i make sure just like you you do when you put a project together the songs need to sound good sequence you know sequentially yeah and yeah, yeah. I want them to sound good even if you have it on random or shuffle or something like that so i'm placing them where i need to be but um i, I say that all to say this that i'm gonna put the best song on that playlist when i release it hopefully i'm got i i, I have it done by the time this podcast airs <laughs> so check your spotify um and check your um, apple music or you can go to my instagram profile yeah, yeah. girl garnett and this girl and then just click the link and then you'll see the playlist yeah. this there but um the song is amazing again i i seen it and i heard it just swiping early early one morning and um well early here um and i was like wait no, let me go back and then i was like you know, i need a comment like i really i really like this like you know and i'm like oh but like and usually i hear good songs all the time but i it doesn't grasp me to like um hit the artist up or something you know yeah but I'm like, I, what's up? I don't know the song really like uh yeah and it is of some sort so thank you for that <laughs> thank you thank you um so one of the questions, two things before I let you go. Mm-hmm. Um, something new that I have been doing within the last two podcasts that I've done, and I realized how important 
it really is and how we as people don't really get asked this um, a lot. Um, but what I want you to do while you're on the podcast is um, tell us something that you're proud of yourself about. Whether it be one, two, three things, you know, from your yeah. yourself about. Yeah, that honestly that I made it through the season I went in because I didn't feel like it was going to end, you know, and I heard I heard this brief little story on Instagram and he was saying, listen, for everyone who's made it through this, you have something for everyone who's made it through this, you have something for everyone who's made it through. And he finished with because a lot of people don't. And the sad part is, is a lot of people don't. We do know of those suicide stories. We do know of those people who are still stuck in it. Uh, we do know of those people who are stuck in it and their lives are ruined. So there's levels to, to when you really go down from a mental standpoint. And so that was eight years of what have I done to myself? And the easiest way, Princeton, for you is to let this go and accept that this is your life now. Mm-hmm. And about two two years closing into me being here now, I had just accepted it. I literally decided to say, I made my choice. I cannot point a finger. I have to accept it. But I was still miserable. The thing that changed is when I said, you just need to reset. If you reset, all of this can change. Please believe that. So for me, the fact that I made it through because I don't think I ever went into those moments of suicidal thoughts, but I was definitely in despair and hopelessness of saying, this is your fault and you did this to yourself. The same feelings that are the foundation for suicide, for strong mental illness, uh, everything that breathes in that language really only results in a negative narrative after the fact. And so the fact that I dabbled in that so long and still found a way and the strength to navigate my way out, I'm proud of myself for that because the results that I'm in now, four or five months later are remarkable. And I can only bear witness to that and tell individuals out there that if you are in a place like that, know that you have the strength to always move forward regardless regardless of the circumstances, as long as there's breath in your body, in your lungs, you can produce movement. Energy is literally in your body. Use it to move forward. Because if you do not, it will only transform into something else. But that energy that that is still flowing in your body can still be transformed into forward motion. That's the narrative that people have to realize because it was the narrative that I had to paint for myself was that even though I'm in this place of despair, still find a way to use that energy, even though it feels like it's negative, it's still energy. Use it to move forward and make the decision that you need to make. So that for sure is the only thing that I can honestly say with a doubt, without a doubt that I'm proud of myself for everything before. I don't know if I earned it. <clears throat> I've had a pretty simplistic life, but I feel like this struggle that almost lasted 10 years, I earned that to get myself out of it. I earned it. I worked for it to say, it cannot be like this. It's another way. You know it. Find it. Execute and move forward. That's amazing. Have you ever... Yeah. I'm going to ask my last question, but have you ever thought of doing the motivational speaking? <laughs> yeah. So that's part of, that's part of the plan eventually. Um, to be honest, I don't know how it's going to play out with the music. Cause my music is, it's really time consuming right now in a way where, like I said, all from no better time. Um, the last month and a half have been very different. So I can't tell you what the narrative is moving forward, but I know beyond the shadow of a doubt, that's the general consensus of every every person I've spoken to. That's from my parents. That ain't from me. I'm not taking credit for that. That's from my parents. So I do believe that is part of the story moving forward. I just don't know to what extent and when that would actually 
actually take place. But I kind of look at that as, well, once you get more established in the industry, maybe you can use those panels where, um, you know, like when Killer Mike with the Greenwood, with the banking app, how he had all of the uh, prominent leaders of the African-American community up on stage talking. I kind of look at maybe it can look like that. Um, different opportunities where I know probably I would be a more desirable person to have up there versus some of the other and entertainers in the industry. So I, I would use this to get in, but once the opportunities opened up, like we're doing right now, I would go full throttle, full throttle, because I know that's part of my purpose as well. Yeah. I see that. And yeah. like, I'd, I'd pay to go hear you talk. <laughs> <laughs> Hey man, I appreciate uh, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I just had to say that. Yeah, uh, I appreciate that. And I ask everybody this. Um, so, um, if you could have an intimate dinner with three people, doesn't matter who they are, they could be living, they could have been deceased by now. Um, who would those three people be, and what would the conversation be? So, I have a very easy answer to this because I have paintings of all three people. Uh, in this order, W.E.B. Du Bois, because of my studies, uh, and the conversation would be about race relations and how on earth he knew the stuff he knew as early as he did when his studies are now still being critiqued. And he really wasn't, I mean, he wasn't really understandable given the knowledge he had and so he's one of my biggest role models and influence when it comes to my collegiate studies so number one him for sure um and the topic would be race relations beyond the shadow of a doubt after that it would be nipsey hustle why because nipsey hustle understood a narrative that was being presented for the black community that was unfortunately snuffed out too early. So if I ever had an opportunity to speak with him, I would ask him where that mentality came from and to see and to understand what's in your goodie bag that you've yet to do. We, I see what you're doing here. What else do you have in the pipeline? I'm sure people would have been blown away if we really knew what Nipsey Hussle was up to because he was on a community initiative to better the African-American community wholeheartedly which is why he died in the same place that he was trying to benefit I yeah. mean so my favorite rapper by far and my favorite individual in the hip-hop community for the sake of what he was doing uh third Ryan Leslie phenomenal independent artist that turned into a financial literacy advocate specifically for young adults, but primarily the black community, just in an incognito way. Um, Harvard grad, 16 years old, um, just insane. And so I look at him and say, what would the conversation be? Teach me your ways, literally. Just teach me your ways. I, from he, the way he executes is so precise. He is literally the best independent example I could look at. I know, I know people talk about Russ all the time and Chance the Rapper, but Ryan Leslie speaks volumes con considering the fact that he's a Harvard graduate and went in, went in before the average person ever does and graduated early. And it's like, okay, that doesn't even make sense. He was a poli sci major and graduated early before he even became a freaking adult, he was out of Harvard. And then he made his way into the music industry and made himself a millionaire through music. And so to transform that, and then to hit the financial literacy realm and start teaching these financial courses and get people to sign up and say, here's how I'm making my money. I did music. However, I use my music, my wealth from music to be able to make other passive forms of income. And in doing so, this is how I can better prepare you to understand the idea of generational wealth. Because he really is teaching that. And it starts from his base of music. So it's like, I'm a huge advocate for financial understanding and literacy, stock market, real estate investing, uh, mutual funds, ETFs, people understanding how the real people of the world make their money. This is what we need to tap into. 
I'm a huge advocate for that. So those three people in that order and in those and, and with those conversation topics would be that. That's awesome. Well, tell me what's what's next for you, or if you know. <laughs> I don't even think I know all the way. Um, there's, there's just again. I got it. Maybe after I get off the phone or after off this podcast, I can ask them because it's like people want to know. Like, what can I say and what can I say right now? So, I can tell you that a massive shift has occurred to where the next level will be soon. Uh, so, you might be seeing me on larger platforms sooner than later. Um, and I'll leave it at that for the sake of safety in the conversation, but that's, what's next for me to, to just, again, just like Ryan Leslie, I use him as a business model is I got to use something to get me in. And if that's music, so be it. I do it. I love it. It's easy to me. It doesn't feel like work, but then once I'm in the door, I want to bust it wide open with all the other things as well. So that's, what's next for me execute music in the most professional sense possible, get in the door and use that as a way to bridge off and start mentoring and doing other types of trainings and guidance and everything you can imagine with my platform. That's awesome. And where can the people find you? So princetonmichael.com, uh, Spotify, same thing, Princeton Michael, Apple Music. I mean, all of the uh, digital streaming platforms, you can find me there. Instagram, Princeton Michael as well. Facebook, like Princeton Michael. Uh, not on TikTok because I don't really do that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> YouTube, YouTube, Princeton Michael as well. Uh, but I'm there. So um, that's where I'm at for all the ladies and gentlemen listening tonight. Much love. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast and dropping some. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Um, and y'all already know where you guys can find me at torellgarnett.com or torellgarnett underscore on any other social platforms. And we're out. And that's all we have for you today. I hope you enjoyed yourself on this episode of Create Your Own Story with Terrell Garnett. We'll catch you next time.